appreciate that. Welcome, everyone. It's very nice to see all of you here today. And, and especially nice, Nan Rittall, where did you go? Oh, there she is. Nan and I met years ago when her little son, Joel, who is probably in his 40s now, right, Joel? Mm -hmm. And I was his first teacher his first teacher in the Corvallis School District. Nan was wonderful, her son was just beautiful, red-headed little guy, very fun. And uh, so today, yes, I do have um, a colleague, someone who is known in this community. I'm gonna give you some information from his bio right now. Jim Green is a fifth generation Oregonian and a product of the Oregon public school system. He's a graduate of Sprague High School here in Salem, received his undergraduate uh, degree in political science from Oregon State University, go Beavs, and his Juris Doctorate degree from the Willamette University College of Law. Jim began service on the Salem-Kaiser School District Budget Committee as a public member in 2007. In 2011, then, he was elected to the Salem-Kaiser School District Board of Directors and was re-elected to this position in 2015. Jim served as a Deputy Executive Director of the Oregon School Boards Association from 2013 to 2016 then took the helm as executive director in January of 2017. Jim and his wife Amy live in South Salem with their two children, Reese and Grace. Jim also has a daughter, uh, Mackenzie, who recently obtained her master's degree and is a teacher in the Greater Albany School District. So it's delightful to have you uh, join us in this conversation. And as Jinx indicated, and so does your um, catalog, class, uh, catalog, we will be discussing critical issues for Oregon's K-12 students this afternoon. It's a discussion about the status of Oregon's public schools, what influences our low graduation rates, what are the obstacles, what are the opportunities around that for educators, and these are very important because typical markers of K-12 student success are graduation, dropout and, att and uh, attendance rates because they get to the core of the requirements for our schools to get the students through primary and secondary education systems. First, Jim is gonna share some information, current information about who Oregon students are and how they are succeeding in our schools. Then he will discuss funding issues for public education in Oregon. Jim Green. Thanks, Tass. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about our current affair of K-12 schools. Just so I know who I'm talking to, how many of you are residents of the Salem-Kaiser School District? So most, if not all. Um, and if you're not, are you from local school district areas, sublimity around the area? Okay, great. How many of you have been an employee in a school district? Good, good. We've got folks with some background knowledge with regard to our students and some of our schools. I'm gonna share with you just some background statistical data. This comes from the Oregon report card from 2016-2017. It's on the Oregon Department of Education's website, but I thought it would be important information for you to take a look at the statistics and the type of students that we're dealing with across the state of Oregon. <clears throat> as, as we introduced, Tass Morrison serves, excuse me, <clears throat> On the North San Diego School Board, she's also one of my bosses. So when she asked me to come do this, of course I said yes. Um, she's on the Board of Directors of the Oregon School Boards Association and serves as our president-elect. She will then assume the role of president the next year. So she has dedicated her time and energy not only to her local school board, but also to a statewide association representing locally elected school boards. As Tass mentioned, um, I'm currently serving in the Salem-Kaiser School Board, so if you have any issues and you want to talk to me afterwards, happy to hear from you. But I'm also the Executive Director of the Oregon School Boards Association. Um, I've worked in public education representing them as a lobbyist primarily at the Capitol since 1992. Took a little break of about seven years to go into private business, then came back to the Oregon School Boards Association. So I've been an advocate for public education for most of my professional career and believe in it so passionately, I decided to run for a school board. 
So by the way, if any of you have any extra free time, um, there are positions on school boards if you'd like to run. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the schools here in Oregon today. So we have a little over 580,000 students in the state of Oregon. We're not a big school district population wise, but we do have unique populations of pockets of students all over. We have 197 school districts currently in the state of Oregon. For those of you that are a little bit of a history buff, back in the day, Oregon had over 3,000 school districts. Each little building was its own school district. Through efforts of the legislature, consolidation occurred to make districts become K-12 school districts. We still have some small elementary school districts out in Eastern Oregon, but we do have 197 school districts. Our smallest school districts, and we have three of them this year, that have two students. They are generally out in Harney County. Um, if any of you have ever been to the Double O School District, um, it's outside of Burns. We also have Troy School District up in Wallowa County. Um, these are very small communities that have to go quite a ways to get to their local high school, so they still have a standalone elementary school district to serve these students. Generally, these students travel quite a way just to get to the school building from the ranch that they live on. Interestingly enough, Oregon still has a dormitory school district. The Crane Union High School District out in Harney County has dormitories for students to live in during the school week, and then they go back to the ranch, some of them, on the weekend. Some of them stay in the dormitory because they have to go over 200 miles one way to their home to the school. It's interesting, um, I did some lobbying on behalf of, they wanted to consolidate these school districts, and I said, well, do you understand that they're over 235 miles between the two school districts you're looking to consolidate, and that's just not gonna work for these kids. They'll be on a bus forever. And I had the superintendent come and bring a picture of the road they have to drive. Luckily, it had snowed that day, and it was a gravel road, but it was so long and so far, you could actually see the curvature of the earth on that road. <laughs> so we have some challenges in the state of Oregon that some of our other partner states don't have across this nation. If you get out to Eastern Oregon, you're in rural Eastern Oregon, and there are some different challenges in providing educational services to those boys and girls, transportation being one of them, which is why they built some dorm schools out there. Our largest school district is the Portland Public School District. They have 48,650 students, okay? Salem-Kaiser is the second largest school district. We're just over 46,000 students this year. Now, that does not compare to school districts in Florida where they have a million students in a school district. They are done by counties in Florida. So for our school districts, most of our school districts, just so you understand in the state of Oregon, fall somewhere in the size of 500 to 2,500 to 3,000 students. The 10 biggest school districts in the state of Oregon have 65% of the students. So we have a lot of small and rural school districts, and our average size is somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 for our school districts. We also get support in providing educational services to students through our education service districts, or ESDs. These are regionally um, operated units to provide educational support. They have a locally elected school board as well. Um, Primarily, they provide support services to our special populations of students. Special education is a big service provider for our education service districts. Braille services, mobility services for our, for our um, blind and hard of sight students. Also, they'll provide technology curriculum testing. And in some instances, especially out in rural Eastern Oregon, they serve, their superintendent serves as that small school district superintendent and their business manager serves as that small school district business manager, okay? Our demographics currently in the state of Oregon, and this has changed pretty dramatically in the last 10 years. We currently have a little over 362,000 students in the state that are white, that's 62.4%. 10 years ago, that number was 72%, okay? Our next largest is our Hispanic Latino group. That group has grown by about 8% over the last 10 years. 
Then we have multiracial. These are self-identified by students and parents when we take this survey. Asian, black, American, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, and then Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. But just so you're aware, for students who don't speak English as their primary language, we have over 200 languages spoken by our students in our public schools across the state. Primarily Spanish, but there are pockets of languages that you can't even fathom where we find teachers for. Interestingly enough, here in Salem-Kaiser, we have a rather large martial ease population. And do you know how hard it is to find a teacher who is fluent in martial ease? It's extremely difficult. You can find individuals who speak the language, but they don't have that teaching credential. So we are trying to fast track teachers within our school district to get them into our system. But there are multiple languages spoken across this state, primarily up and down the Willamette Valley, but there are pockets throughout our state as well. We have a little over 60,000 students who are English language learners. That means they do not speak English as their primary language at home. We are required under state law to provide them services so that they become English language learners. And it's done through a variety of programs and services depending on how the school district determines to provide those services. We can do immersion, we can do dual language. There's a variety of ways we go about that. Unfortunately, the next number has grown exponentially in this state. We have one of the largest population percentage of students in the nation that are homeless. We have over 22,560 students that are currently homeless in this state. And that's probably, according to the Department of Education, an under-identified number because students don't like to tell people at school that they're homeless. And interestingly enough, districts that you think wouldn't have large homeless populations have huge homeless populations. Beaverton, for example, has the largest homeless population of students in the state. There are approximately 80,000 students currently that are receiving special education services at some level from their school district. There's a federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, we call it IDEA, that requires school districts to provide a free, appropriate public education to students who are identified as needing special education services to augment their regular education services. Generally, um, you have most of our students are what we call low cost, high incidence. These are our LD, our learning disabled students. It's not so much the students that are on the high cost, low incidence side who are in wheelchairs and have a one on one aid, but we, we serve about 80,000 of these students across the state of Oregon with special education. The next number is also shocking. Remember the first number I shared with you? We have 580,000 students in this state. 281,000 of them are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Poverty is a huge issue in our state. Salem-Kaiser, for those of you that don't know, has the largest percentage of poverty students in the state at over 34%. Some, to, some other statistics, and obviously the first one, we're not real proud of. We've got to do better with our four-year cohort rate. A four-year cohort, for those of you who are not familiar with that terminology, those are the kids who enter as a freshman. You would expect them to graduate with their senior class four years later. 76.7% .7 of our students meet that mark right now, and we have to do better. If you take a look at our four-year graduation rate for our career technical education concentrators, CTE is career technical education. For those of you in the room, it used to be called vocational ed. It was called voc ed when I was in high school. Career technical education has changed quite a bit. I would encourage you to visit some of the schools in your area to take a look at career technical education. But when you get a career technical education concentrator, that means they're taking at least two classes in approved CTE programs that are approved by the Department of Ed, look at that graduation rate. What does that tell us? Kids who are engaged in something that they like, graduate. 
Another number that has really spiked in Oregon in recent years are what we call our chronically absent students. These are students who miss more than 10 days in a quarter. We're at a little over 108,000 students currently are chronically absent. And if you compare the data, it's really interesting to break this data down. When you take that number and you compare it to the kids who are not graduating on time, it's a pretty good correlation of the same students being chronically absent, not graduating on time. If you want to graduate on time, and I tell my kids this, I have a junior in high school right now. Um, how many of you remember back in the day when you had a junior in high school? They wanted to sleep in, going to school was like, oh, I really don't want to go to school today, Dad. Well, then you're not going to graduate on time. And when I look at my son, I go, don't you want to get out from under mom and dad's roof? Because mom and dad want you out from under our roof. <laughs> and currently, our dropout rate, again, not a number we're proud of. It's a number we need to bring down. Is almost 7,000 students in the state of Oregon dropped out last year. Means they did not complete. Okay, that does not include folks who go on to get their general education diploma, the GED, or they transfer to another school. These are kids who we don't know what happened to them. They just didn't plain show up again. We didn't get a records request transfer from another school or from another state. These students just dropped out. <coughs> so now I'm going to turn it over to Tass. Or am I still talking on this one, Tass? I'm still talking about this one. We're going to go into the critical issues that are facing schools right now. Any questions on the statistics? Again, it's pulled off the Oregon report card, and each school district gets its own report card. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those before. You can go to the Oregon Department of Education's website, pull up report card. You can pull it by your school district, or you can look at the state statistics. And it's really full of interesting statistics, like how many students do we have that fit into those minority categories that are taught by someone that looks like, like them. It is a ream of paper that I have down there on the front, on the front line that has really interesting statistics. If you're into st statistics, like I am, especially around education, um, you can really nerd out for a while on that thing. Um, but I would encourage you to go to the website and look at your local school district report card. And under there, there are also building by building report cards you can take a look at, okay? So let's talk a little bit about funding here in the state of Oregon. And um, for a lot of you, uh, it has been a battle for a really long time. I, I, as Tass introduced me, I'm a fifth generation Oregonian. I grew up on the southern Oregon coast in North Bend. When I used to say North Bend around here, people said, oh, Bend is such a lovely city. I'd say, no, 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 Coos Bay. Oh, Coos Bay. The town just north of there is North Bend. Now, you can't tell when you're in either city, but I grew up in North Bend. North Bend, back in the day, had the dubious distinction of being the first school district in the state to close down because its levy failed. We were out of school for a month because our voters didn't pass the levy. Now, how many of you have lived in Oregon long enough to remember the safety net and bond levy elections with your school districts? Okay, if you're from California, this is a different conversation. Prior to the passage of Ballot Measure 5 in 1990, which was our property tax limitation, each and every year, school districts would get a report from the Department of Oregon saying, this is how much money you're going to get from the state. And it was roughly 25% of their overall operating uh, revenue they got from the state. The other 75%, they had to go to their local property taxpayers and hold a levy election to assess property taxes to meet that number. And actually, as a school board member, um, I would like to be able to have that conversation with our property taxpayers today. We don't get to have that conversation anymore, thanks to Ballot Measure 5, because it flipped the funding on its head. I think we've lost that conversation and that connectivity with our local property taxpayers because of Ballot Measure 5. Not saying that we shouldn't have done something to limit property taxes, don't get me wrong, but I think we've lost that opportunity to have that conversation. Because like many of you in this room, only about 70% of Oregonians currently have a connection to public schools in some way or another. They have family that teach there, or they have students or grand, grand students that go to school. We're only at about 70%. 
And I think for a lot of us, we'd like to be able to have that conversation to re-engage people about how critical our educational needs are and what it means to our state overall. But after the passage of Ballot Measure 5, we flipped that equation on its head. Now, 75% of our funding comes from the state, and 25% of that comes from local property taxpayers. And every time we have ever asked the question, OSBA, where I work, has done polling with voters in the state of Oregon to ask them, what do you think of your property taxes? And guess what everybody says about their property taxes? <laughs> They're too high. And guess what their favorite tax is? The one the other person pays that they don't have to pay, okay? So property taxes are too high. Ballot Measure 5 also did something else unique. It locked into our Constitution our property tax system. Prior to the passage of Ballot Measure 5, there was only about seven or eight paragraphs in the Oregon Constitution dedicated to property tax. After Ballot Measure 5 and Ballot Measure 47 and Ballot Measure 50, all that adjusted Ballot Measure 5, we now have over 65 paragraphs in the Oregon Constitution talking about property taxes and how we deal with property taxes. And it is one of the hardest taxes to change in the state of Oregon. Why? You all answered the question, what are your property taxes? They're too high. They're also locked into the Constitution. So if you want to change your property taxes, you have to have a vote of the people to do so. And explaining property taxes in the state of Oregon, you can't do it on a bumper sticker. And unfortunately, with elections now, we're at bumper sticker mentality with regard to issues that come up. Oregon is also a little bit unique at its state level because we get state general fund dollars. That's how we get the state school fund. And we fund other agencies, the Department of Human Services, Department of Corrections, our courts, all those things, they get funded by the state general fund. Our state general fund is the second most reliant general fund in the nation on a sole source of income. The first most, can anybody guess it? Alaska. They are an extraction tax state. They are funded primarily out of oil and oil production in the state of Alaska. 87% of their general fund comes from extraction taxes that they produce within the state. Oregon is the second most reliant, and we are reliant on the income tax, whether it's corporate or personal. And guess what people say about the personal income tax in the state of Oregon? It's too high, okay? We have a pretty flat tax rate in the state of Oregon anymore. Um, most people are already at 9%. You're either at somewhere from 5 to 9% in there. But we are the, sing the second most reliant state on a sole source to fund our general fund, which funds all those services and many more that I didn't mention. And guess what happens when we have a recession? Income tax collections go down because people get laid off or payrolls are reduced a variety of things. So Oregon is also the first most cyclical in nature as it relates to the overall economy of the state with regard to having money in our general fund to fund education, whether it's higher education or K-12 or Department of Human Services or a variety of programs and services. So we have an overall reliance on the income tax and schools are primarily funded by the general fund in the state of Oregon. So in 2008, when we had a downturn in the economy, the Oregon legislature went into, they call them special sessions, trust me, they're not special in any way, shape, or form. They are about the most least special thing you can do is go into a special session, but they generally do it when they're gonna do one thing, cut budgets, because there has been a downturn in the economy. In 2008, they went in three times and cut our overall funding for K-12 schools each and every time because they didn't have the money to appropriate the dollars that they had done for that biennial budget. And in 2008, I was lucky enough to volunteer to be on the Salem-Kaiser School District Budget Committee, and they made me chair. And guess what I had to do? Cut $575 million out of our school district budget. Okay, 
That was not a fun thing for us to do looking at it over about a three year period. We ended up only having to cut about $57 million that year and luckily that recession didn't continue on and have to make those cuts. But I can tell you we laid off over 500 teachers in this district alone and we have not hired them back yet. And guess what? Each and every year we've had a 2%, at least a 2% increase in our student population. Those are some of the challenges that we're facing, at least in the Salem-Kaiser School District. I know Tass is facing in her school district. And as I travel the state, I see those going on across all school districts. We're a little bit lucky here in Salem-Kaiser. I really want to thank most of you in this room, if you've lived here a long enough time. We have had the ability to pass bonds to help with our school buildings. Over the years, in 2008, we did a big build. We're asking for another one now. But we, are, um, we have been fairly lucky with regard to our vote on bond levies to help build and upkeep our buildings. I can tell you that is not the case across the state. One of the challenges that many school districts are facing are aging school buildings. And I encourage you, if you'd like to meet and greet any of our school buildings in this city, I'm happy to take you around to them. We have some schools in this school district in Salem-Kaiser that are over 100 years old now and we are still providing educational services to students in those facilities. Now, we also have some newer ones, some nicer ones, admittedly. West Salem High School, pretty nice high school. Cesar Chavez Elementary School out off of Cordon Road. If you haven't been in that elementary school, that's what a new elementary school needs to look like. It's two floors, it's got elevators. It also has a teaching lab room in it so that there are two-way mirrors with two classrooms on either side so that our beginning teachers can watch veteran teachers and how to teach and those beginning teachers can be watched by mentor teachers and their administrators to improve their instructional outcomes. But I can also tell you building a new school building is not a cheap endeavor across the state of Oregon. We are asking, um, and this is not a campaign, so I'm not campaigning, I'm not asking you to vote yes on it, I'm just gonna give you the information on the Salem-Kaiser bond. We're asking for about $620 million in bond authorization for Salem-Kaiser on the May election date. And most of you go, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie about that. But we are not building a new building with that money. We're not buying any new land and we are not building any new building for that amount of money. We are retrofitting and fixing existing buildings and adding classrooms onto existing school buildings. Purchasing land now across the state is exceptionally expensive, especially the size that you have to purchase to either build a high school or a middle school, because with a high school or middle school, you also have to have attached athletic fields and PE uh, rooms available for them. For a brand new high school in the state of Oregon, it is now expected to cost almost a half a billion dollars to buy the land and build a school that will house roughly 2,000 students. It's expensive, and we figure that it'll cost a roughly 300 and some odd dollars per square foot to build. Um, new buildings and existing facilities within the Salem-Kaiser School District. And I'm sure that's probably the same that TAS is experiencing out in North San Diego. But again, we're very thankful for our taxpayers across the state and in this district. Uh, they've been very supportive of our programs going forward. Another challenge that school districts have are the cost of their public employee retirement system. How many of you are PERS recipients? This may, this is may you want to, where you want to wake up here, okay? Um, I, interest full disclosure, I'm a PERS member as well. My brother is a PERS retiree, um, but we are seeing dramatic rate increases with regard to PERS. You can see here that the rates that school districts are currently paying, this is prior to a 6% pickup. Because remember under Oregon law, the employer or the employee can pay that 6%. That's a contractual negotiated issue. This is prior to that. So most school districts have a rate for PERS of 27.2% of payroll. It's always expressed as a percentage of payroll, okay? Due to increased costs in the system, the advisory rate, these aren't final yet, the actuary is still looking at it, that rate will go to 33.59. 
Now, last year in the state of Oregon, the legislature appropriates, and remember our legislature appropriates on a biennial basis. I'm sure Jackie Winter shared that with you when she was here in February, right? Talking about the budgets. We do it on a two-year basis biennially. Last year, the school districts in the state of Oregon got an appropriation out of the legislature to operate for two years of $8.2 billion. That's a lot of zeros, and it is a lot of money. They split it 50-50, so for each academic year, school districts in the state have $4.1 billion to operate schools. Let me give you an example, because when you start looking at all the zeros, it kind of clouds your mind, doesn't it? Billions of dollars to run a school. How much do you think it costs to operate the Salem-Kaiser School District for one day? That's a pretty good guess. It costs about a million dollars a day to operate the Salem-Kaiser School District. That's payroll, that's running buses, that's feeding the kids, that's all the things we do in a school district to keep it operating. It's about a million dollars a day to operate the Salem-Kaiser School District, a little over a million dollars a day to operate Salem-Kaiser. So when we saw the amount we were getting out of the state school fund at 8.2 billion, obviously people go, that was a big increase. Yes, it was an 11.4% increase over the previous biennium. But our cost of operation went up 17.5%. If we were going to continue to do everything we had done those previous bienniums at the same level, we had a little bit of a gap. And so districts had to make some choices with regard to what they were going to do and not do, not fill positions, not buy technology. My daughter, who is a seventh grader out at Crossler Middle School, does everybody know where Crossler Middle School is out south? is still using a civics textbook that has Ronald Reagan as president. Districts make choices when they don't have the funds. The choice we've made is not to do a curriculum purchase at middle school for civics. We require the teachers to update that material each year. How long ago was Ronald Reagan was president? I was still in high school when Ronald Reagan was president. So those textbooks are out of date. We also don't do curriculum and technology purchases. But these are some of the challenges that we're facing funding-wise in the state of Oregon. What are some of the opportunities that we've got? I've already mentioned one. Taxpayers understand that school districts have aging buildings. They want to make them safe. We live in a pretty seismic active area of the world. And we are trying to make our schools much more seismically act or safe. Um, and our voters have always been able to step up to the plate and help us out when we've asked them to, not only in Salem-Kaiser, but across the state of Oregon. There have been slight increases in school funding, and we still have local control of our schools. If you think we ought to buy new textbooks in the Salem-Kaiser School District, you can come talk to your locally elected school board member, you can testify before the budget committee, and tell them you need to make that a priority. We still have locally elected school boards who make decisions for each and every school community in the state of Oregon. While we're somewhat hamstring by the amount of money we get from the state, we still have the say at the local level as to what goes on in our schools. We have seen slight increases in school funding coming from the legislature. When they have the revenue, they understand the economic impact of making sure that every student graduates and becomes a productive member of society. Recently, the legislature's also recognized we were one of two states in the nation that put no money from the state behind our school facilities. It was all on the backs of local property taxpayers. Now they've created some uh, matching grants, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why school districts have been more successful recently in passing bonds. Because they can go to you, the taxpayer, and say, if you back this, the state gives us $4 million that we don't have to pay back. So districts like John Day, Grant Union School District out in Grant County, passed a bond for the first time in 36 years because their taxpayers said, well, if we put in $4 million and the state's going to put in $4 million, we get $8 million and we can move our high school potentially out of a flood zone. We also have seismic rehabilitation grants. Senator Peter Courtney, one of our senators here from Salem, has made this one of his biggest priorities, seismic safety of our facilities. And guess what's gonna happen if and when we get the big one here in Oregon? 
if houses start to tumble, and I don't like playing doomsday, but it could happen. You've all read the papers. You've all seen the reports. Where do people normally go when there is a natural disaster? They go to the schools. And when we have schools that are 100 years old, guess what they were primarily built out of? Brick and mortar. And guess what comes down in a seismic event? Brick and mortar. So we are working to re reestablish and reinforce those buildings, those unreinforced masonry buildings, and the state has stepped up to help us with that. They're putting together some money, and we've actually accessed some here in the Salem-Kaiser School District to do some rehabilitation in McKinley Elementary. It sits up there behind Skyline Ford. It's one of our older school buildings. It's a beautiful building. I mean, it's just one of those iconic elementary schools if you've ever driven by it. It's one of those old brick buildings. but. It was a brick building, um, and we had to do some reinforcement in it. Now you walk into that school and you look up the staircase, and there's big steel girders that are going up the inside of the school building to help reinforce that site. That came with some of this state money. Ballot Measure 98, how many of you remember Ballot Measure 98 in the state of Oregon? It was one that was passed to, to provide funding for career technical education. Remember the statistic I showed you about CTE concentrators and their graduation rate. A group known as Stand for Children thought, if that really is the fact, that we can drive up graduation rate by simply offering more CTE programs that get more kids interested, let's put a ballot measure together. They put a ballot measure together, put it on the ballot. Oregonians overwhelmingly passed that ballot measure. Clear message to the legislature, create and fund more CTE programs. Legislature in 2017 funded half of what the ballot measure truly needed to be funded. But we are seeing an increase across the state of Oregon with CTE programs through that funding that will be coming out to school districts this next year. One of the things that I would encourage you to do if you haven't done already is visit one of your local high schools and look at their career technical education program. We in Salem Geyser are very fortunate. How many of you are familiar with the Career Technical Education Center? or CTEC. If you haven't toured that facility, call our office at Salem-Kaiser and get a tour of that facility. It is truly amazing. It is a public-private partnership with Larry Tokarski of Mountain West Investments here in Salem-Kaiser. He gave the school district $9 million to help build this facility out on Portland Road. And it is an amazing facility where we are growing programs for boys and girls based on what businesses in the mid Willamette Valley area tell us they need employees for. Out of that Career Technical Education Center, it's one facility where all six of our comprehensive students, juniors and seniors can go and focus in on career technical education. We have six programs out there currently, manufacturing, home construction, let's see if I can remember them all. Um, we have barber and hairdresser, they actually run a uh, barber shop and hairdresser shop out there. If you'd like to get your hair cut, the kids will cut your hair for you. They actually do a pretty good job. Don't look at me. Um, <clears throat> we also have um, auto body collision now, where car dealers in the area gave us $250,000. The kids are operating state-of-the-art collision and repair facilities and can get jobs out in the community that will pay them over $50,000 a year walking out the door. We also have manufacturing, we have drone technology, 3D imaging and printing, and um, videography. And what we found with regard to C-Tech, and if you go out and do the tour, by the way, it's not the adults doing the tours, it's the kids that are showing you around. So schedule a time to go out there and take a look at it. Maybe it's a field trip. Um, somebody was asking for a program for next year. I think a field trip for you guys to go out and see C-Tech would be absolutely amazing to show you what kids are willing to do when they're given the opportunity. A couple of stats about CTEC real quick. Salem Kaiser, kids who went to CTEC last year, 97% of them graduated on time. Four of our six valedictorians came from CTEC. The other thing we've done out there is the kids only go there two days a week, and then they're at their local high school. We provide transportation to get them there, but we've also put out there embedded math and embedded English classes. 
so that they are practical applications. There is a math teacher and English teachers out there, and I'll give you an example of what I mean by embedded practical math. So in our home construction, the math class focuses in on how much lumber are you gonna need to build that house? How many square feet of lumber, how many panes of glass, how many reams of shingles are you gonna need to build that house? The applied English class for that is, how do you fill out a building permit with the city of Salem? And if you need a plan change or a zone change, how do you do that and how do you write that up? Those are real life practical applications that these kids are learning coming out. One of our other programs is at North Salem High School. We have a cabinet making program there where 85% of the kids come out with a job the year they graduate. These are real programs that kids are taking advantage of and we're seeing an increase in graduation rates because guess what? Instead of being adult focused, we're being kid focused on what they wanna learn. A Couple other uh, things that are going on. Hopefully you've all heard or at least maybe read about the joint committee, uh, the joint special committee on student success. It was appointed by Speaker of the House and the Senate President. They are going to do a road trip around the state of Oregon to look at all these unique programs that we're doing to try to figure out how can we improve our graduation rate, lower that dropout rate, get our chronic absenteeism rate under control, and what does it cost to do that? I think it'll be rather interesting to find out how they do this. They modeled it after their transportation package. You all remember they passed a billion, multi-billion dollar transportation package, and they did that by traveling around the state and looking at our infrastructure. Hopefully they'll be able to come back from this road trip and say there are great investments going on across this state, but we can do better and we need to target and focus it and hold folks accountable to make sure that our kids aren't falling behind. One of the other challenges that we have in the state of Oregon, then I'm going to turn it over to TAS, is with regard to our instructional hours in the state of Oregon. Interesting statistic came across my desk the other day and I verified it with um, Craig Hawkins, who's the executive director of the school administrator program. If you graduate from our neighbor to the north, if you graduate, you go 12 years to a Washington school district versus a student who has a career here in Oregon today, they have almost one more year of instructional time in their educational career. Let me say that again. One more year of instructional time. Think about the kids that we're not graduating in a four-year cohort. If we had that additional instructional time for those students throughout their elementary grades and their middle school grades and then focus really in on high school, what could we do with that graduation rate? What could we do with that dropout rate? And to be honest with you, it is a resource issue. It's not just money, it's also people. TAS is gonna talk to you about some of our challenges with some of our staff and some of our opportunities. Any questions at all on the funding portions that I just talked about? Jim, yeah. um, our, our usual procedure at this point is to do Q&A with microphones. And given the time, how about we do okay. that for about 10 minutes, then we'll take a 10 minute break and then let TAS start after the break. Does that work? Sure. Um, this is Barbara. I had the pleasure of touring the CTEC. I, I attend Chamber of Commerce meetings, and I was so impressed because for so many years we made kids feel that they were second rate if they weren't college material, and I think that's a lot of the reason for the dropouts. And these kids were so impressive. As you say, they did the tour. They spoke very... Um, and in a very adult manner, but they were they were getting out of that program with jobs. I so I so applaud the school district for doing that. Thank you. And again, if you haven't toured and you'd like to, please reach out to our Career Technical Education Center. They do tours on a daily basis for people. Do it while the kids are in school, though. It's much more interesting than during the summer months. Um, I have a question about the um, CTE program. Um, I appreciate the high graduation rates, but I wonder if you have any data about um, earnings uh, in the future, not immediately after graduation, 
because I'm aware from uh, many young adults I talk to that not many people stay in the same career their entire lives anymore. So I'm curious about how higher education affects earnings and how um, graduating from high school, which is gr also uh, um, also is uh, an improvement in earnings, but how the CTE people do in the <coughs> long, longer picture. There's a great difference in the occupations that you mentioned also in terms of earnings, I believe. Yeah, th there is. Um, I'll be honest with you with the data on CTE. Oregon is starting to refocus its efforts on CTE a little bit. So we're gathering that data about salaries and how long people stay in their careers. One of the things that we've been able to do, though, is work with local business to say, what are you looking at as a job market three years, five years, and 10 years down the road? And try to address those needs going forward. We do have some data on some of our CTE programs that have been around a, a little while in Salem-Kaiser. And you're right, if you graduate from high school, your earnings potential go up by two and a half million dollars over a career versus a student who doesn't graduate from high school. We know that to be true. We also know if you graduate from an AA or a community college, your earnings potential goes up a four-year institution. But you're right, we need to focus on those students who aren't going to college. Because I think if you ask students in our high schools today, only about 60% plan to go to college. And when you look at how many actually graduate, it's below 50%. So we've got to address those needs. One of the programs that we do have some data on, and I didn't bring it today, West Salem High School has a uh, firefighting EMT program. Salem Kaiser School District owns a fire truck, if you didn't know that. Because you can graduate from West Salem with your AA in firefighting and EMT and go into a job either in the Salem-Kaiser Fire Department because you've been trained by Salem-Kaiser Fire Department firefighters. You can go in at their entry level job. Those jobs ultimately pay out at over eighty-five dollars to $105,000 at the end of a career on an annual basis. So we do have some data. I didn't bring that. I'm happy to share it though. Um, we're going to be gathering that data because it is important data for us to get. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, at one time, there was tracking of a five-year graduation rate. Is that still uh, We do track our five-year cohort rate, and obviously it's better. Um, you're graded, however, under our report card and under the um, what we call the Every Student Succeeds Act. That's the old No Child Left Behind Act. Um, we're still graded on our four-year cohort. Our five-year cohort rate is over 80%. But our four-year cohort rate is what we're compared to with other states. And, and I'm not using this as an excuse. Please don't see this as an excuse. Oregon also has the most stringent definition of a four-year graduation rate of any state in the nation. Yeah, this is Eileen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just have one question. That's about um, the, uh, the graduation rate. And um, I just wondered, in, how does Washington get five year, I get an extra year crammed in. Is it extra days per year or how do they get that much more time? So our instructional hour limits are set by the State Board of Education. You have to have so many hours and so many credits to graduate. We have some of the lowest in the nation here in Oregon. Washington's limits on what they require in an instructional year are more hours and more days. And I, I'll, it, it just costs more to do more hours and more days. As I said, you had a day in Salem-Kaiser, cost us a million dollars. Hi, this is Jim. Uh, when you were presenting your, your uh, data for the various, uh, the cost, the budget, I was wondering, I may have missed this, did you include charter schools? I think we had a speaker a few weeks ago that said they were under the boards of education. So charter schools in the state, <clears throat> excuse me, charter schools in the state are public schools in Oregon. We have roughly 136 of them. So the student numbers that I showed you included all those. They're public school students. Um, the dollars that go out, the $8.2 billion, charter schools are also funded out of that because we put our dollars out to school districts and charter schools based on the number and type of kids that you have in your programs. And charter schools are funded in, in essentially the same way, although they don't get the full what we call ADMW, Average Daily Membership Weighted Grant, that a school district gets because they're not required to provide transportation like school districts are. Okay. I had a second part to that question. And it's not a second question, so don't attack me. We're not allowed to ask two questions. Um, 
the homeschool kids. Uh, there must be some budget set aside for them because I know they participate quite often in school activities, extracurricular. So homeschool students in the state of Oregon are not counted in our statewide student count. We do have numbers for them and they're in the report card. I can provide that to you if I, when I look it up. They are not funded um, out of the state school fund. Generally, if a homeschool student wants to participate, and I'm just gonna make up, let's say they wanna play baseball out at Sprague High School. Um, as long as they are in attendance of the Sprague High School boundaries, they can play baseball there if they make the team. They also have to meet certain requirements academically, and their parents also have to sign off that they're actually homeschooled. You register for homeschool in the state of Oregon through your local education service district, but to fund that baseball part, Sprague High School can charge that home, homeschooled student whatever it is they're charging other students play baseball. By the way, at Sprague High School, that's $175. I wrote that check about a month ago for my son to play baseball. They are also eligible for a reduction if they can show that they would be eligible for free and reduced lunch, just like any other student in our school system. Okay, before Jim, Jim has a third question, let's take 10 minutes. <laughs> let's take 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your first hour. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I have uh, a fairly extensive uh, information to share about uh, what, what's working and what doesn't working and uh, doesn't work and why uh, for our current uh, students in Oregon schools. One of the um, one of the issues is around relevant curriculum and programs. You heard Jim's example about his middle school daughter and the civics book that she is currently using. One of the obstacles to providing students with uh, relevant curriculum and uh, programs is, of course, the chronic disinvestment in K-12 schools in Oregon. We currently rank 32, uh, excuse me, 32nd in average per student spending according to Governing Magazine. We are consistently ranked one of the worst states for school funding. Massachusetts is the top state for funding in the U.S. Certainly chronic and uh, underinvestment in K-12 education in Oregon has had a detrimental effect on providing current and relevant curriculum and programs to meet the needs of today's students. Only 51% of Oregon students agree that their course requirements are relevant to their future, according to a report that was just um, issued a month ago by uh, Oregon Student Voice, and I'll talk about that group in a minute. The priority for school boards is always to fund do, uh, teachers first and preserve critical programs for the students. But when state revenues shrink, so do resources for schools. And our schools are less resilient to budget fluctuations. You may recall that in 2003, 84 of our 197 school districts shortened their school year because the money ran out. And we gained notoriety in the New York Times that year for this. And we were the brunt of nationally syndicated cartoons because of this. School attendance is so strongly associated with high school graduation rates that it is central, uh, a central uh, measure of Oregon's progress for students in Oregon. Said one school board member at that time, the short school year in Oregon seems to suggest that it is okay for students not to take school seriously. And one anecdotal report suggests that Oregon parents and community members expect something for nothing and lack empathy for challenges facing our public schools. And we never really fully recover from these setbacks. Our students can never, reco uh, never recover the lost learning under these conditions. Even now, according to Michael Wilfong, who is the uh, Oregon's uh, Director of School Finance and Facilities, he said even with the $8.2 billion the state is expected to spend uh, on schools during this biennium, it still falls short of about $2 billion uh, 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 for the needed 10.5 billion needed to fully fund education in Oregon. 
Another issue for us in Oregon is the urban-rural divide. In Oregon, 38% of Oregon students attend rural schools, and these students deserve special attention because they face two unique challenges, distance and income. We know household incomes um, show a strong correlation with student achievement. In 2014, income per person in non-metro Oregon was only 83% of the metro average, which was down from 96% in the mid-70s. Study after study finds students from lower income households face educational challenges that their higher income peers do not. So rural districts, on average, aren't pulling the achievement of middle class students up to the levels attained by their more affluent peers and uh, in the urban and suburban areas, thereby limiting their prospects for sustaining productive, economically viable, and satisfying li uh, livelihoods. And in turn, this has a deleterious effect on Oregon's overall economy. And this is true for providing relevant curriculum and programs to meet their needs. Rural schools have a harder time attracting and retaining teachers, and economies of scale prevent a variety of electives that keep students interested and engaged in school so that they stay. Distances in rural Oregon pose an additional challenge. For older students, distance limits exposure to college and university uh, campuses, which translates then into lower rates of enrollment in post-secondary education. The challenges of distance show up in at least two indicators, post-secondary enrollment and chronic absenteeism. Low attendance rates and chronic absenteeism is clearly a problem for us and a challenge. In 2016-17, 20% of Oregon students were chronically absent, meaning they missed more than 10%. And you saw uh, some of this information on Jim's report. High school seniors missed the most school as 38% of 12th graders across the state were chronically absent. The percent of regular attendees de decreased this year, I'm sad to say, according to the state report card. It went from 81.3% down to 80.3%. Lower attendance, lower attendance rates lead to lower achievement. School attendance is so strongly associated with high school graduation rates that, again, it is a central metric of Oregon's progress toward our graduation goals, and it is a factor even more significant than performance on standardized tests. I mentioned earlier the Oregon Student Voice. This is a, a fairly new group formed in 2016, and it empowers students to be authentic partners with education decision makers. Last year, they surveyed 2,130 students from 42 high schools across the state of Oregon, then issued the reports called the State of Our Schools, and it was issued last uh, this past March, on uh, uh, the first week in March. And they uh, published uh, or reported on student opinions on a number of factors. They concluded that the practice of exclusion from decision makers has led to a vast majority of students feeling disengaged from school, and that contributes to the high absenteeism and dropout rates. Last year, my board in the North Santa Am School District added a student position on the board who served this entire school year. Many boards in Oregon have recently engaged students as partners in the decision making, either at the high school level, working with the principals and other administrators, or with the school board. Oregon's short school year is a, bar uh, is a barrier to providing relevant uh, curriculum and programs. Oregon is consistently ranked among the worst states for school funding. It has shorter school year, more students per class, and lower graduation rates than most places in the country. And experts do trace the beginning of these trends to the passage of Measure 5 in 1990. 
Well, most states require students to spend about 180 days in school, uh, a year in school. Oregon requires only 990 hours for high schoolers or about 165 days. And Jim talked about the contrast with the state of Washington, whereby students who uh, succeed and complete a K-12 education in Washington typically have about a year more of education in school than Oregon students do because of the uh, number of days in the school year. The number of instructional hours, of course, then for our students results in less time learning. We have lack of resources for career and technical education programs. That trend is changing now, but it has not uh, been easy and it's uh, been very recent to, to um, uh, provide these programs for our students. And they're critical not only because they attract many of our students who are then more likely to complete high school, but because Oregon's workforce is aging. Many baby boomers are planning to retire in the next 10 years, taking their skills and their experience with them and creating a tremendous shortage of trained workforce, which in turn will negatively affect Oregon's economy. Over the past 20 years, many districts eliminated or significantly reduced vocational programs with the emergence of required federal uh, and state academic assessments. To create technology and campus space alone is cost prohibitive for Oregon schools. And until recently, there was limited funding available from the federal government and the state to ramp up or create new programs that meets the needs of today's learners and their futures. Another uh, problem for us is that many parents and public members and educators still view CTE, career and technical education, in conflict with academics. Though research does show that students who take a concentration of CTE courses are more likely to graduate on time, and we saw that evidence produced today uh, uh, for students here in the Salem-Kaiser School District who are CTE concentrators. Lack of uh, adequate mental health services is also a barrier to providing relevant programs and uh, for our students. It is estimated that 10 to 12 percent of children aged 9 to 17 years in Oregon have mental health disorders to the extent that they have difficulty learning. Oregon averages one school counselor to 600 students, one of the worst ratios in the country. We've seen a huge increase in the number of serious mental health issues that we are not equipped to handle, said a counselor recently from Crossler Middle School here in uh, Salem. In the Oregon Student Voice State of Our Schools report, 40% of the students who were surveyed report that access to mental health resources is the most important issue for K-12 policymakers. Severe depression and anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder are some of the increasingly prevalent and least understood mental health disorders among Oregon's K-12 students. Now for the good news. So what are some opportunities around relevant programs and curriculum? Well, first of all, um, some not so good news. Prior to last uh, school year, Oregon's third grade reading scores were improving. Last year, however, they dipped. They dipped by 1%. And prior to last year, our attendance rate was improving. And last year, it dipped. A national study released uh, recently shows that students who do not read proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to leave high school without a diploma and than their proficient readers. Poverty compounds the program. Sorry, poverty compounds the problem 
Students who have lived in poverty are three times more likely to drop out of school or fail to graduate on time than their affluent peers. Fortunately, we have some promise for students in Oregon. We have the Eastern Promise, the Willamette Promise, and the Oregon Promise programs. These are some proven practices and opportunities. Since 2013, Eastern Promise has been a collaboration between Blue Mountain Community College in Pendleton, Eastern Oregon University in La Grande, Treasure Valley Community College in Ontario, and the Intermountain Education Service District located in Pendleton, and uh, collaborating with 37 school districts in Eastern Oregon. Students have the opportunity to participate in college level courses and earn credits or certificates while still in high school. And that means a real financial savings for families today, a critical advantage given the low income of many of Oregon rural families. And increasing the number of students who are prepared to attend college directly from high school is the goal of the Eastern Promise. Willamette Promise has served students since 2015. The Willamette Promise is a collaboration of 20 school districts in Marion, Polk, and Yamhill counties, the Willamette Education Service District, Chemeketa Community College, Western Oregon University, the Oregon Institute of Technology, Corbin University, and industry leaders in the South Metro area here in Salem. The Willamette Promise uh, Partnership provides all high school students the opportunity to complete up to 45 credits while in high school prior to transferring to an Oregon college or university, including community colleges. It also provides high school students an opportunity to complete career and technical education courses that lead to a career pathway or industry certification while still in high school. And it is designed to uh, empower all students, but especially those from underrepresented populations, to be immersed in a college-going culture. Oregon Promise is a state grant that covers um, most tuition at any uh, Oregon community college for recent high school graduates and GED recipients. The program was launched by legislation passed in 2015 and grants uh, became available for students in uh, the fall of 2016. Ballot Measure 98, funding for CTE programs. Uh, Jim talked a bit about this and the opportunities that it brings for students throughout the state. It was approved by uh, Oregon voters in 2016. It's called the High School Graduation and College and Career Readiness Act, and it provides direct funding to school districts. And every district and charter high school is el eligible uh, for the funds, and there are $170 million allocated by the legislature for our schools. The requirements are to establish or expand career and technical education programs, to establish or expand college level educational opportunities for students, and to establish and expand dropout prevention strategies. The Carl uh, Perkins Educa Vocational Act is another source of funding for our schools and has been since uh, the mid-1980s. It provides Oregon schools annually with over $13 million for uh, CTE programs. We also have the Secondary Career Pathways funding, which was uh, established by the legislature in 2016. This is a first attempt at a sustained funding source for CTE programs. These funds are meant to incentivize intensive CTE programs that lead to high wage and high demand occupations. And we had a question uh, after Jim's presentation about uh, future wages uh, for students. And, and how those uh, can be sustained. And that's the purpose of that program. It's focused on advanced manufacturing, engineering, agricultural science, aviation, 
robotics, forestry, home, uh, home construction and renovation, and the biomedical and health sciences. In my district, Staten High School, that is my high school in the North San Am School District, will receive over $376,000 for its Pathways to Health program. The grant money will be used to develop curriculum, pay teachers, and buy needed equipment and technology for a new five-year pathway to be implemented next year. Students who participate will be able to take classes starting in the eighth grade that focus on the biomedical fields. And we're starting a boot camp or holding a boot camp uh, this summer to expose students uh, to various career uh, programs within the uh, health uh, field. Uh, uh, some examples of recently established career and technical education opportunities. You heard one of the best in the state, uh, the Salem Kaiser Technical Education uh, Center is one of the premier programs in the state. Along with Baker, Baker School District has the, the Technical Institute, Baker Technical Institute, and it is also looked at as a premier program uh, that serves students in Eastern Oregon. Sisters High School, if you're familiar with that, uh, has a pilot training program in aviation, and that is uh, receiving quite a lot of attention as well uh, for their high school students. And there is an emerging focus on mental health in our schools. There are some promising practices here locally. The Polk County School-based uh, mental health program works in partnership with local schools. And um, the Salem-Kaiser School District has partnered with Marion and uh, Polk Counties and Trillium Services to provide mental health services for students. And there are school-based services throughout other districts in the state. Some uh, programs that focus uh, intensely on students is the AVID program and the ASPIRE programs. AVID is an acronym for Advancement via, in, dif, via Individual Determination and it's dedicated to closing the achievement gap by preparing all students for college and post-secondary opportunities. Dozens of Oregon middle schools and high schools are participating and over th and thousands of students are benefiting from that learning system. Aspire is access to student assistance programs in reach of everyone. It trains volunteers to work with students on a one-to-one -one basis who need encouragement, information, and technical assistance to reach their career and education goals. And many schools have implemented the Aspire program as well. So there is hope and there is a lot of opportunity. Next, um, is it about time for a break or not quite? No, we're good, okay. Somebody let me know if I go over here. So I'm just gonna keep uh, going through what the opportunities are and the obstacles are here um, until it's time and so, um, Next, I want to talk about equitable opportunity and academic achievement and some of the obstacles to that because that is a major factor, equity serving our students that influences student achievement. We continue to experience achievement gaps in learning, especially for students of color, including lower graduation rates and higher absenteeism rates. We have an inconsistent equity focus in our schools. School districts with higher enrollments of uh, students of color have developed their knowledge and skills regarding learning differences for minority students and students of poverty, but not all school uh, districts um, have fully prepared staff, and school, including uh, school leaders, to address adequately the different needs of different learners. Bias does exist and students of color consistently lag behind white students due to institutional bias. Recent evidence shows that students with teachers that look like them might in fact perform better in school. There's a study called the effects of teacher match on students academic perceptions and attitudes found that where students and teachers matched both in gender and race and ethnicity, the outcomes were considerably more positive. 
particularly where black students are concerned and especially for black girls. Currently in Oregon, 10.1% of teachers and 11.2% of administrators are people of color or speak English as a second language, while 36.6% of all students are minorities. Poverty and homelessness also provide uh, some uh, difficulties for us. The average percentage of school-aged children in Oregon falling below the poverty line in 2017 is 16.2. That's just for school-aged children. Research demonstrates that a significant correlation between student achievement, student engagement, and overall student poverty While all students in poverty can achieve and succeed um, provided adequate services and help, the education system um, may impose barriers that often result in achievement gaps when juxtaposed especially with students from higher incomes. Insufficient funding and staffing were the barriers district most identified regarding the implementation of programs and services for students of poverty. Economically disadvantaged students graduate at rates about 16 points below the rates for students who are not economically disadvantaged in high school. And achievement gaps start way before school uh, students even enroll in school. Children in poverty entering kindergarten have tested upwards of a full year behind their peers in math and reading. And indeed, children of poverty are less likely to attend preschool and, have, uh, and are less likely to have uh, access to educational books and other resources within their home. In addition, in the 2016-17 uh, school year, Oregon school districts counted over 22,500 children who were homeless, and we saw that number in Jim's slides as well. It's a record high for the state of Oregon, one in about every 25 students. And in Marion County, we have 1,758 at last count homeless uh, school-aged children. Poverty in rural areas has far exceeded urban rates since the 90s. It can range from 20% to 80% of the students in rural schools who are uh, it's children of poverty. So let's talk about opportunities there then for equitable uh, opportunities and academic achievement. In 1991, the Oregon Legislature passed the Minority Teaching Act, and it, the purpose is to increase the, the number of minority teachers, including administrators employed by school districts and education service districts, to be approximately proportionate to the number of minority children enrolled in public schools. It's been amended several times. We're Make it, working on that goal at a snail's pace. It's very difficult for us in Oregon uh, to reach that goal. It was amended in 2013 and 2015 and again in 2016. But we keep working at it and that's important for our uh, student learners. Teach Oregon and Oregon Teacher Scholars Program are also promising practices. Uh, Teach Oregon is a partnership among universities, community colleges, and school districts to pilot innovative models for collaborative teacher preparation in Oregon. One of the priorities for Teach Oregon is the recruitment of more teacher candidates from historically underrepresented groups to support a teaching force that reflects the diversity of our students in Oregon. And the Oregon Teacher Scholar Program offers scholarships of $5,000 for next year, 2018-19, uh, for racially or linguistically diverse teacher candidates who are accepted and enrolled in an or uh, Oregon um, teacher training program. 
Because of the focus on preparing minority citizens to enter the education profession here, there has been an increase in the workforce diversity. In 2016-17, districts increased employment of culturally or linguistically diverse teachers to 10.1%, which represents a 5.5% increase uh, over the prior year. And the data show that since 2011-2012, districts have increased the number of ethnically diverse teachers hired in Oregon schools by 21%. That's exceptional. But this progress has not kept pace with increasing diversity of Oregon's student population. Students of color now make up more than one-third, as you saw in the uh, Jim's presentation, one-third of Oregon's K-12 population. Use of evidence-based student learning programs like AVID and Aspire to accelerate the potential for underrepresented students to stay in school and pursue post-high school education are increasing in Oregon schools. And increasing the number of minority teachers and school leaders will likely result in more minority students being able to sustain productive, economically viable, and satisfying livelihoods. Next, I'd like to talk about quality instruction and student achievement. This has a significant impact on what influences our graduation rates and overall student achievement, of course. Some of the obstacles are that research shows that teachers are the single most important in-class factor in determining whether and how well students learn. We used to think it was parent participation was the number one factor and, and class size was the number one factor. But there wasn't much research to, pack, to back that up. Now there is. Now the research is telling us that that number one factor is the quality of the teacher in the classroom. Studies have shown that well-qualified teachers and high-quality teaching can close the achievement gap between economically disadvantaged students and their more affluent peers. Educator pay and value is an issue for our workforce. Teacher salaries in the U.S. are generally lower than those offered to other college graduates. Even after adjusting for the shorter work year in teaching, beginning teachers nationally earn about 20% less than individuals with college degrees in other fields. A wage gap that can widen to 30% by mid-career. In Oregon, teachers and administrators are being paid less than years past. Adjusted for inflation, the average teacher or administrator makes about the same or less than they did six years ago. Staff salaries increased at about the rate of inflation during the 1990s, but health care costs have greatly increased, and that has made the difference in the rate of pay. After adjust, adjustments for inflation, uh, superintendents are earning uh, less, principals are learning less, and teachers are earning 5.3% uh, less than they were in 2010-2011. We also recognize that lack of supports for educators are a barrier and obstacle uh, to our workforce and schools. Evidence shows that it is the system of supports put in place to ensure teachers reach their goals that makes teachers more effective. Research shows that beginning teachers who have a mentor are more likely to believe their instructional practices have improved and they are more satisfied with their jobs leading to a higher retention rate and that's very important and you heard Jim talk about the new elementary school, new or newest elementary school, Cesar Chavez here in, in Salem and the uh, teacher training um, facility that they have for new teachers and administrators. That's significant to teacher uh, job satisfaction and retention. If we wish to recruit and retain high quality effective beginning teachers, mentor programs are vital to their, uh, their job satisfaction. In 2012 and 13, almost one in ten teachers in high poverty public schools left the profession.
In contrast, less than 1 in 15 left, uh, teachers in low poverty schools left. The persistently higher rates of turnover in high poverty, high minority schools contribute to a concentration of inexperienced and unprepared teachers in the high poverty schools. And this is a significant deterrent to improved student achievement and our graduation rate and achievement scores will improve only when the lowest achievers improve. Insufficient professional development is another reason teachers say they become dissatisfied with the profession. The problem right now is over $2 billion of federal funding for teacher support is slated to be eliminated in the current budget proposed uh, and supported by the White House. Additionally, this bill uh, cuts um, education funding by $2.4 billion for public schools in Oregon, Aspi or around the nation, sorry. Aspiring teachers also cite the, co uh, the cost of college preparation as a factor uh, when deciding on a career in education. And lack of instructional time is an issue. It serves as a clear deterrent um, to improving student achievement. Not only the shorter school year uh, compared to other states, but time during the day. America's public schools, when they were first established in 1600, 1640 about, uh, they were established to teach reading and writing and arithmetic and the values that uh, served a democratic society. In recent decades, about 60 six zero programs and curriculum areas have been added as requirements for public schools. But little or no additional time has been added to the instructional day for the last 50 years. So what are some opportunities around quality instruction and student achievement? Well, one of those is professional learning com uh, communities. Most schools now have instituted some form of peer professional learning for teachers to meet together on a regular base basis, usually weekly, to share expertise and, collabor and work collaboratively to improve teaching skills and the academic and social emotional performance of students. In my school, uh, school, and you might hear schools that have late starts, we are late start for our uh, professional learning communities is every Monday morning. At, uh, we have a late start at 9 o'clock for teachers to work and collaborate uh, on students. We have improved evaluation systems now for teachers, and so some of you who were teachers may be interested in uh, knowing what those changes are. Teachers uh, are now involved in creating uh, their own uh, evaluation systems along with uh, the administrators who are responsible for supervising teachers because it, they can be re it's research based. Now we have a lot of evidence on what uh, works in the classroom, instructional habits and how uh, to evaluate that. Often teachers um, and principals are spending more time in classrooms observing and giving feedback regarding these instructional habits and teachers have the opportunity to observe their peers and give feedback. In my school uh, district, teachers and administrators go on what they call learning walks. They observe a classroom as a team to calibrate and affirm how the teacher engages students and uh, provides uh, effective instruction. Teacher mentor systems are also common in Oregon now and very important to the satisfaction and the growth for young teachers. The Oregon Mentoring Project was started in 2013 and um, helps to ensure a strong system of leadership, professionalism, and excellence for teachers and leaders in Oregon. The TELL survey is very important for our teachers. That acronym stands for Teaching, Empowering, Leading, and Learning, and is a national online anonymous survey administered uh, to all licensed and school-based educators in a district or a state. And it's administered every other year, and it's voluntary. And the research from the TELL survey is shown to be uh, connected to student achievement and teacher retention. 
that allows teachers to express their opinions about the culture of support in their school. And educators need supportive school environments where they feel valued and trusted and empowered to collaborate in order to improve instruction. Increased academic achievement is uh, certainly an opportunity. Again, research shows that the single most important in-class factor determining whether and how students learn is the most important factor. And um, teachers, studies have shown that well-qualified teachers and high quality teaching can close the achievement gap between economically disadvantaged students and their more affluent peers. Strong school leadership is a factor that is critical to improving teacher effectiveness. And uh, research has shown that schools that have highly effective principals, school leaders, perform five to 10 percentage points higher than if they were led by an average principal. They have fewer student and teacher absences. They have effective teachers stay longer and they replace ineffective teachers with effective teachers. School safety and wellness is our next, next topic and I'm wondering if we might wanna break now. Okay, thank you and um, see if there are some questions or some comments or we can do that or take a break. Okay, all right. Questions? Hi, I'm Jeanette, and you know, we're hearing about the teachers that are striking in the rest of the country now, indicating that we're not the only ones with problems, and the teachers feeling undervalued and being concerned about their students not having the opportunity to learn enough. How do you think Oregon teachers compare? I mean, are the salaries better here? Are that or those places where they're striking represent the ones, the states with the lowest salaries? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I heard your question. Uh, how, how the, with, the, with the teachers striking in other states, how would Oregon relate to that? I mean, do, do our teachers make more so that they're content, or does that represent teachers throughout the nation? Well, I think we're seeing, number one, the uh, teachers are um, gathering together uh, to insist on higher uh, salaries in states where um, the salaries really are the lowest for teachers. Um, at least that's what I know from what I've read so far. I haven't um, heard from, uh, for instance, the Oregon Education Association. Jim, maybe you have about this. You want to talk so about So the strikes we're seeing right now, the one that was in West Virginia a week or so ago, the one that's currently going on in Oklahoma, those are two states that have statewide collective bargaining. Their salaries are set by their state. In Oregon, we have collective bargaining at the local level. So our teachers here, while they could go out on strikes, strike statewide, it would be an illegal strike because it's not pertaining to their collective bargaining agreement that they have with individual districts. We don't experience a lot of teacher strikes here in Oregon. That's a good thing. Um, according to the statistics from NEA, the National Education Association, largest teachers union in the nation, Oregon ranked ninth in teacher pay across the nation with an average. Now remember, this is an average of about $63,000 a year as a teacher salary right now. I can tell you, my daughter, who's a first year teacher, 
is not anywhere near that number. And I'm assuming when I look out across the crowd and some of you were teachers, that wasn't a number you were being paid either. I think teachers have done pretty well in collective bargaining in the state of Oregon. But what you're seeing right now in Oklahoma, West Virginia, um, I've heard a couple other states, those are states that either don't have collective bargaining laws at the local level or they do collective bargaining at the state level. Remember Washington, I think it was a year or so ago, the teachers um, walked in on Olympia because they do have a statewide collective bargaining teacher salary schedule. Most local districts add on to that um, in the state of Washington. But right now, according to the data from NEA, we rank ninth in average teacher pay. And in most instances, teachers are paid on two things. One, their numbers of years teaching. That's a step in a collective bargaining agreement. And then there are columns depending on the level of education that a teacher has. A bachelor's degree plus so many hours towards a master's, a master's with so many hours towards a PhD or an EDD, an educational doctorate. And then those that attain those generally move up in pay with regard to number of years and education that they have under their belt. Hi, um, my name is Sally. Discussing these uh, salaries, this isn't my question, but just to give you an example, when I started in, well, I probably shouldn't say the year, but I will, <laughs> 1960, I made $1,000 for the year. <laughs> and that was in New York, upper New York State which was supposedly one of the higher paying. Anyway, my question, <laughs> getting to my question, uh, you didn't mention AP classes. Do they still have that, or is that something else that they do? So yes, we still offer advanced placement classes. Those are AP. We also have IB, International Baccalaureate Programs. Uh, South Salem has that program for us, which is a higher, a higher level of requirement of attainment and achievement in order to get your IB diploma. AP classes are still offered at the high school level. Students opt into those. They can take an AP test, and depending on the school they apply to, the college they apply to, if they score at a 3, 4, 5, most private institutions are 4 and 5. Some of our public institutions are 3 really depends on the college you apply to, you can get credit for that class by taking that test and achieving so much on it. I will tell you, um, my son is taking mostly AP classes. They're tough. They're real tough. Plus, you got to pay about 75 bucks a test. So I always tell him, don't make me waste my $75. You better study for that, buddy. Okay. Uh, for both Tess and Jim, on mental health, I was very astounded to learn that the ratio, if I remember, is one to 600 in terms of counselors to students in, in, as an average in the state. I'd like to suggest something and ask you how to achieve success in this. If the state legislature allowed retired teachers and retired social workers to contract with school districts and in the high density, mentally unhealthy schools, uh, to contract one or two days a week to supplement the current counselors. How would we go about that to, to make that vision a reality? So there's a couple of ways that we can currently do that today. If you're teaching or credential, your license that's been issued to you, in Oregon it's by the Teachers Standards and Practices Commission. One of the things you'll learn about education, if you weren't involved in it, we're acronym rich. So we will fall into acronyms all the time. That's TSPC. If you still have that, you have the ability to work for a school district now, and you can do it even though you retired, limited on a number of hours. I would think for individuals who don't have that credential, let's say a licensed psychologist who's not licensed by a teaching agency, we would need to make a change at the legislature to allow that person to come in and be a counselor to school to school children. It's, it's an abysmal number, people. One to 600 is average. I can tell you at Sprague High School, where my son goes to school, there are over 1,600 kids in that school. There are three counselors. Hi, this is Jim. Um, Tass, I think you mentioned uh, the relationship between community colleges and, and the high schools. And it recalled, uh, to my mind, that in Dallas, uh, they used to have a very low graduation rate. I don't know if they still do or not, but it seems like, and I used to meet quarterly with the school board, 
that it was caused by this articulation agreement with community college where the seniors could go directly into college level classes without having to pay for them and complete a year at least of community college. Have they resolved how to get the graduation rates counted towards those students or is it still a problem? Still a problem. It's still a problem. And, and there are some community colleges that work better with high schools. Mike. There are some community colleges that do work well uh, in that regard with high schools and high school students and others um, who are resistant to that. So we we still work with that. Oregon State University has provide, provided resistance uh, to the Willamette Promise uh, students um, and, and that is uh, being pursued as well. So yes, those are some obstacles that we have yet to um, meet. And, and it comes back to a point I made earlier in my presentation about how Oregon defines its graduation rate. Remember I said we have one of the most stringent definitions of graduation rate? Let me give you an example of this. In the Lebanon School District, their superintendent worked out an agreement with the Lynn Benton Community College that if a student would extend their period of time in school and enroll in a fifth year and go to Lynn Benton Community College and either work to get towards their AA or achieve their AA from previous classwork, they would pay for that education in Lebanon. Lynn Benton Community College worked out a reduced amount of tuition that would be paid, and the Lebanon School District said, great, kids who want to do that, we're going to get you essentially an AA degree, a two-year college degree, by the time you leave the Lebanon School District. Guess what that activity did to the Lebanon School District's graduation rate? It drove it down because they weren't graduating in their four-year cohort, which is what we're graded on is your four-year cohort. But what a great opportunity for those kids, right? They could work their junior and senior year, their traditional junior and senior year in high school, to get some AA courses through Lynn Benton Community College, then stay enrolled in the Lebanon School District and Lebanon would pay tuition for them to complete their AA degree. But yet it drove down Lebanon's graduation rate for their school district. And actually their graduation rate was below 65 because of that. Which is why I said, you've got to really dig into the data and understand how we define that. Because what a unique opportunity for a student, right? They can leave Lebanon High School after five years, not only have their graduation degree from Lebanon High School, but a Lynn Benton Community College Associate of Arts degree. But it wouldn't count towards their graduation rate. Hi, Pat here. Uh, I was um, talking or asking in regard to the CT program. I think that's wonderful that kids can have a life skill when they get out of high school. And I'm wondering what the criteria is for a student to get involved in that. Uh, they have to keep up their regular schooling, I'm sure, but I, I would think there would be more want to get in than can get in because of the demand. So with, <clears throat> let me use our school district as an example here in Salem-Kaiser and then Tass may be able to talk about hers. For our C-Tech program, the one that's out on Portland Road where we send the kids out there to get to the program, they have to apply for a position in there. And when we built the program, we were more afraid that kids weren't going to go. Because it's kind of scary for a kid to leave their local high school to go to a program with a bunch of kids from the other high schools. Well, I don't know if you follow baseball movies, but it's one of my habits. I really like Field of Dreams. You remember that movie? If you build it, they will come. We built it, and there are more applicants than spots available out there. So they do have to uh, meet with their counselor, meet with teachers, and show that they have some acumen to doing that. That's not to say those are our only CTE programs in the district. At each one of our high schools, we have additional CTE programs. And my son is in one, he's in the architecture one out at Sprague. You just have to um, apply, put it in your class schedule, make sure you meet whatever prerequisites are required for that. Like one of the prerequisites for medals two at Sprague is you gotta take medals one. So you gotta make sure you take your prerequisites but um, in Salem-Kaiser, at least, if a student wants to participate in a CTE program, even if it's not at his or her local high school, 
we will try to make that work for them. Because we have plenty of students enrolled at the West Salem High School who want to get that firefighter EMT program who are not West Salem attendance boundary students. We try to address that because we want to make sure we're addressing their unique needs. We can't replicate that program in all six of our schools. But if we have a student who lives in the South Salem attendance boundary wants to go to that program, we will try to make that happen for him or her. Um, hi, this is Jinx over here. I have the last question. A number of years ago, Salem Kaiser made a valiant effort, I think, to um, do a, what they called a year-round school. It really wasn't, but it was a calendar that was spread out that did not have the huge summer break and then the loss that we know happens over time. It was finally abandoned, and uh, one of the issues was always child care and the number of families that counted on the older brothers and sisters to provide that, as, um, uh, as well as the complication of sports schedules. Given the newest wrinkle with this sports schedule thing, I don't see how individual school districts can do anything about trying to change the school year, it has to happen at the state level, I would assume. Do you have any comments about that? Well, I think, um, number one, we, it was also abandoned at Salem-Kaiser at the time when we cut $57 million out of the budget. Because remember to operate our school, even if you're doing it on an extended school year, while it may not cost a million dollars, it's still expensive to operate school. Um, so it was during a time of budget cuts um, we will, and we do offer some year-round schooling for some of our student populations at early college program here in Salem-Kaiser and our Roberts Alternative High School. Some of those students qualify for year-round schooling. We do that. Should we do it on a broader basis? Yeah, um, because we all know they call it the summer brain drain. For some reason, kids just forget stuff over the summer. Um, I, I tell my kids, okay, let's do some reading this summer. And it's like, what's a book, you know? Um, but we, we should do a better job of it and some of its resources. But if we're going to do it and have it funded in that way, the state's going to have to make up either some sort of special allocation to school districts, change our funding formula in some way for that to occur. Um, but it is important. And we know we have a summer brain drain. You know, um, with regard to athletics, there's a big issue. Surprise, surprise, if you haven't read about it, with Salem-Kaiser sending kids over to Bend. Um, trust me, it is, it is the number one issue as a school board member that I've received the most email about. The number one issue that I've received the most email about. Um, it is something we're going to have to take a look at. By the way, just as a bit of trivia, we looked at one point of cutting athletics in the Salem-Kaiser School District when we were doing budget cuts. How much do you think it costs for the athletic program in the Salem-Kaiser School District. Your number is now the number. It's $2 million was all it saved. If we cut all athletics for Salem-Kaiser in 2008, that was 10 years ago, it was $2 million savings was all we would see. Well, Tass and Jim, uh, you have given us a lot to think about. We thank you very much for this information and your great presentation.